Startups and SMEs is where we started. It's very close to our hearts. It's what drives us and how we build innovation because we want them to grow. So it takes a very uh, big period for companies to accept online payments. And for startups and SMEs, a month makes a huge difference. They can't, they need the cash, liquidity to fuel their yeah, growth. Not many of them have a 12 month runway. Exactly. Yeah. And the goal was from the beginning was to bring it down to 48 hours. So if there is a new trend of behavior that is being adopted by the market, it's our role to bring it on board, put it along with our standards, keep it simple to enable for our clients. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech, and technology. Ardian is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with To You, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. To you connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDS vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards and more. Hello all, welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun. I'm your host, Arjun. Joining me today, all the way from Kuwait, is Ali Abul Hassan, who is the founder and CEO of Tap Payments. Ali, welcome to the show. Welcome thank to you. the couch. Thank you, Arjun. Right? Well, you know, I must thank you. You've come, you've made all the way from Kuwait. Of course. Right. It's not that far. It's not that far. And I do I do visit Dubai pretty but often. You do? <laughs> you do, and you have a business here already. And and I met a part of uh, met members of your team, including the gentleman who's going to be running yes. uh, uh, the UAE business. Uh, but I've got to be honest with you, you are the first Kuwaiti born fintech that I've actually had the opportunity um, to meet formally on the cuff. Right. And I hope uh, I can represent Kuwaiti startups or fintechs in a positive way. So, so the way this works is, Ali, it, it's it's a conversation, right? Yeah. Um, I, and and we're gonna go on a bit of a journey, yeah. right? And, and this journey is going to be all about tap payments yeah. and you as their founder and your team. Um, and it's a no hold bar conversation. So feel comfortable with whatever you'd like to share. Uh, my whole intention here is that let's make this engaging. 
Uh, and let's just make sure that people really understand what tap payments is all about and where you guys are heading, right? So we have about 45 to 50 minutes. Yeah. We usually always blow that time limit, uh, but I usually try and keep it to 45 to 50 minutes. We've got a lot to go through. So why don't we dive straight in, right? And I guess my first question to you is, you know, what was the genesis behind tap payments? I would, uh, I would put in, in two ways, or I think two phases. First, I realized and uh, before starting with TAP that uh, I knew how to help friends who were looking to set up online payment acceptance uh, okay. in, in Kuwait. And what was a challenging part in Kuwait is that we have a debit network, and we have the credit card networks. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge was uh, the integrations of both were not unified. They're okay. two separate integration flows, experiences, and setups uh, where it takes an average of a person or a company to uh, enable payments from three months to a year at the time. That was back in 2000. 12, and you're talking specifically about e-commerce payments. E-commerce payments in Kuwait. That was, uh, let's say, a point where it kind of triggered, why is it that way? Why can't it be simpler? Which is going to be my question. <laughs> yeah. Why was it going to take a year? Uh, because typically banks at the time, who were the providers of such payment services, uh, and they still do, but at the time, it was only banks. Uh, basically had a very low risk appetite of enabling first debit cards, which would take a few months because they're not tech technically or technology savvy with their uh, clients. Okay. And then they need to see uh, transactions for around six months until they decide to enable credit cards, which is another integration also and a decision. And you know how... It works within banks. It takes a long time. So it takes a very uh, big period for companies to accept online payments. And for startups and SMEs, a month makes a huge difference. Yeah. They can't, they need the cash liquidity to fuel their yeah. growth. Not many of them have a 12 month runway. Exactly. Yeah. And the goal was from the beginning was to bring it down to. 48 hours mm -hmm. and that's what we achieved we unified acceptance of debit and credit cards in kuwait which were knet visa mastercard and american express all enabled in a single integration within 48 hours that was the start but i believe the second point was what inspired the true let's say aim or ambition what we want to do with tap payments we're in a region that is very fragmented and any company that's based out of the region would like to grow into neighboring countries mm -hmm. now is it easy to grow and evolve it is a big hassle mm -hmm. and that's another complex problem that we wanted to focus on yeah multi jurisdictions different regulators exactly uh, you know talent etc cetera, etc cetera. exactly and that's what we wanted to do is how we can unify the technology piece and the handling of funds in a in a protective manner while being regulated uh, in a, in an approved way in every country and how we can bring it all together into a single relationship so the challenge here was there is a lot of there is a huge potential of the region. Mm -hmm. We are a very big with, let's say, strong purchase power, very tech savvy, high internet penetration. Everybody is highly banked, yet it's still very hard for companies to accept payments in the region. You know, I have a we I have a view at least in the UAE that I say. We're overbanked and underserved. True. It is true. It, the uh, statistics are quite clear. True, true. Uh, the, the GCC in particular is very much highly banked. Is it, and you would say in the UAE at least, I would say till very recently, debit cards were not even enabled online. Yeah. And now even the behavior of paying with your debit card in the UAE 
is not a common practice. Mm -hmm. Where the neighboring countries, they're all debit card oriented. So it's very important to understand how the, the behavior of consumers are. And this is not known for most entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So an entrepreneur that comes out of the UAE thinks how the market behavior is based on their consumer behavior mm -hmm. living in the UAE. Which is but, different. Which is very different in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Kuwait, in Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman. Even in Jordan, Lebanon. The whole region is very much different. One country from another. Yet we're so close to each other. So the real potential of the region is not yet reached till now. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of complexity which needs to be managed. But I'm going to, I'm going to take you back a little bit in your time, right? So, so you, you were actually helping, as you said, friends and businesses who wanted to get online initially before you launched tap payments, right? And, and you said it was taking anywhere between three months to a year before they could get their debit card and then their credit card, right? So what encouraged you to say that if I come into the market, I can actually change the attitude among the bankers to move faster? Mm -hmm. Right, and I'd, I'd, I really would like to hear the war stories that led to the establishment of tap payments because you know you've taken something which took a year to something which now is taking days. Yeah, right. You're still working with the same banks, true. Right, uh, arguably the same people in the banks, true. So, so you know, how did you go about it? Because let's be honest, were you the first person to think about it? We were the first uh, company that offered that in Kuwait. Uh, and in the region, we were amongst the first. The same time, the, f the year or two, because if you look at, there were, there was a company that started in Saudi 2014, 15. Uh, another one based out of UAE that got acquired. And another one that started in the UAE and now is a global company. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have a lot that's coming out from the region. Uh, each company came with a different angle. What what triggered it is I was probably in a time uh, in my life, I would say, that I really wanted to do something that had a purpose. Um, I don't know why, to be honest. Okay. And <laughs> so it, it, it hits probably any, I, I assume every guy or any person who hits their like late 20s maybe, they just want to do something that is impactful. You don't know what you want to do. I actually did a lot of different businesses in the beginning. I failed <laughs> in some. Uh, lucky with TAP, I would say. Uh, and uh, I've always had a passion to, towards payments for some reason. When, my, when friends came to me to help them with payment enablement online, it, they didn't come to me just because it's payments and it just was like, oh, let's just check. Can you assist here? And it happened to be that I have done it before. It, I wasn't an expert. I've just okay. done it before. Uh, I've never worked in, in a bank, <laughs> uh, but I work very closely with banks. So um, I've been in payments almost all my career. The mm -hmm. first job I worked was ironically in payments. But uh, it was not part of the banking sector. It was in a closed loop payment network, All right. which exposed me into uh, how the payment landscape is. I actually wanted to leave payments. Tap brought me back into payments. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, That's interesting. Uh, That's interesting. But let me just put you on the spot here, right? So you decided I'm going to I'm going to start tap payments. I'm going to start in Kuwait. I'm going to solve a big problem. What were the three biggest challenges that you overcame or you faced? Yeah. So, um, number one, trust. Uh, trust the banking tr people trusting you or the, the, the whole the, the, the whole the whole ecosystem? The whole ecosystem. Okay. Keep in mind that at the time, there isn't a provider that offers payment services other than a bank. Yep. So, who are you to come in and offer such services? That's one. So you need to gain trust. Build on that. Second is funding. Funding uh, at the time, um, basically the ecosystem 
the venture capital ecosystem was not yet developed. Not at all. Uh, I even learned the word angel investor after starting time. Starting a business. <laughs> starting a business. Uh, basically, that was another second part. Uh, a third part would be um, the awareness and understanding the role of what a payment company at the time the word fintech was not commonly used mm -hmm. but what was the role of a payment company or a fintech in in relation to the existing stakeholders of the industry and how do you build that awareness how do you build that education with no references that are out there uh, everyone who thinks of payments at the time was thinking of companies like paypal basically and uh, when you think of anything you think consumer Mm -hmm. where we started in enabling payments for companies right. and enabling online payments. So it's a niche that not a lot were comprehending. Online payments at the time was still new in the region. It was actually advanced in Kuwait, mm -hmm. but new, still new in the region. Okay. Because the first online payment, uh, online payment transaction that was performed in Kuwait was around the year 2000. Okay. So that was the time. Way ahead of other markets, like I'll give you another example. The first online transaction done on a local network in Saudi was in 2018. Wow, okay. Didn't and know that. That's an interesting <laughs> fact. We so didn't learn. that's 18 years, but and see where Saudi is today. It's way yep. advanced with technology and with financial inclusion. It's an interesting take. What was the discussion like with the central bank in Kuwait at that time when you launched? Uh, being the first and offering uh, a service that is not the norm in the market. <laughs> Which nobody knows about. <laughs> doesn't mean that you want to always highlight it straightforward unless it's in a developed uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So... Regulations was not yet developed at the time. Okay. Uh, licensing in Kuwait, surprisingly, became formalized for payment companies just in 2021. Wow. Okay. So we are actually the first regulator who licensed us officially was Saudi Arabia, Sama, Central, uh, Saudi Central Bank. Which was in 2018. That was in 2018, late 2018 into the sandbox. Right. Officially in 2020, 2020. Yes, during COVID. Okay. Uh, we also had, during that period, a regulatory license from uh, Central Bank of Bahrain. But it's also very important to highlight, even though the Central Bank of Kuwait established their regulatory licensing framework officially in 2020, one 2022 uh, we had uh, an open dialogue uh, to allow payment companies to operate so that's a very that's important the question i was going to ask you but you obviously were in communication constant communication because at the end of the day you know you're positioning yourself in a very important part of how the money flows true true and and it's very important that a regulator uh, has visibility into yeah. all of such of such it's activities. Super essential. So uh, what we did initially is we always had a bank with us to make sure that there is a trusted party um, communicating either on our behalf or collaboratively. And we've done that in Kuwait. We've done that in UAE. We've done that in Qatar. We've done that in Oman and in Egypt. So what we have been investing a lot from the beginning is how we can uh, operate in a market that is yet evolving in regulations and how we can position ourselves in uh, in a manner where the regulator respects and sees that well we're preparing ourselves there's a company that we're willing to work with because if you neglect all of that you can't uh, continue. Uh, it's not only about disruptive technology. It's about innovating within your regulatory 
Environment. Environment. Yeah. Totally agree with you. Now, so Ali, but that begs the question, right? So you've been at it for a while and you've been at it in a number of markets, right? So two-part question, right? And I want an unvarnished uh, answer from you, okay? Uh, what is your reading of the current state of what we call fintech in the region, right? Second part of the question, right? And I, I'd rather just say the second part because I think second is subset, which is if you look at payments, which is quite an integral part of fintech and as a matter of fact, has been the catalyst of fintech in this part of the world to a large extent, what makes payments in the markets that you mentioned, GCC and some of the North African countries, different to what you have experienced or seen in other parts of the world? Um, I'll start with the first one. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of an experience I've had. If you want to talk about fintech and how it is in the region, uh, first it changes from one country to another. Yeah, extremely, mm -hmm. it changes. So let's say I'm gonna start with Saudi. Okay. Uh, it's common for me, and it happened to me more, twice, where I would sit with an Uber driver. And the Uber driver is talking to me about fintech. Okay, <laughs> that gives you a sense of how the ter the term fintech became mainstream. Okay, what does that mean? It means that there are a lot of companies or a lot of entrepreneurs that are looking into this uh, vertical, and a lot of startups call themselves fintechs today. And many are moving towards that. Uh, there's, it's a positive thing because you have a lot that's happening, but the long term is what is gonna define where fintech is gonna go, at least in markets like Saudi. Okay. There are other markets where, when you mention fintech in the GCC, I don't want to mention the country's yeah. names. Fair enough. Where they don't even understand what it is. And and that's in the GCC alone. So, and those countries are so close to each other. So we're in a region that's very much, uh, I would say bipolar mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from a fintech perspective. Uh, we're very advanced in one way and the opposite in another way. Not because they're, it's not advanced, it's maybe the terminology is not yet developed. Yeah, so, so let, let, before you answer the payments question, right? So, so I have a view, but before I share the view, I want to ask the question. Why do you think that's the case? So why does an Uber driver sitting in Riyadh or driving in Riyadh understands the word fintech, right? And why doesn't the same... But, well, a different person in the same occupation in a different part of the GCC doesn't register that word. What, what's different? So well, why I this, think... Why this bipolar... Ad, <laughs> why, why this bipolar state? Basically, uh, we need to really give acknowledgement to the leadership in Saudi. Okay. Uh, especially with Vision 2030. And what has been invested into the different goals in Vision 2030. Um, it defines a lot of ambitions. One of those is financial inclusion. It is. And uh, the structure that has been put from the regulator to the operator to the enabler in Saudi Arabia has played a huge uh, role from SAMA to basically Saudi payments to FinTech Saudi and of course the CMA all of those and how they've been collaboratively building awareness. Fintech Saudi has played a huge role. Mm -hmm. The training programs, uh, they do fintech tours. Uh, they I actively <laughs> participate in those. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've done so uh, ourselves That's also. No uh, a lot of, uh, we participate in the internship programs that, that are coming out from Fintech Saudi. So I believe what is happening in Saudi and the, the direction that's coming from the financial sector development program uh, is is a key part of why an Uber driver would mention fintech. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think I think you're 100 accurate in that, and and you know I I I, I totally agree with you. Uh, 
I I have a view in which is uh, I guess uh, adjacent to what you're saying, which is, in my humble opinion, and I mean globally, for fintech to become what I call uh, commonly understood, this whole concept of embedding finance yeah. in non-financial services is going to be one of the key catalysts. True. True. Right. So whether it is you know uh, uh, an Uber driver or someone in healthcare, or a retailer, or automotive, or aviation. Yeah. I do think the power of embedded finance in terms of catalyzing and the understanding of FinTech is gonna be critical. Yes, I totally appreciate, I think the regulator and the wider environment and the education and upskilling would be great. And I think it's important, uh, but I do think embedded finance does. Payments, what's unique about payments in this part of the world? Um, right, versus some of the others. I'll, I'll give you a comparison. We'll start with US, then I'll go to China. Okay. If you're, uh, if you're a startup in the US, how many payment methods are you looking to enable to serve your market segment? Half a dozen. Really? Well, you know, I do want pay... I, well, I do want... Uh, well, you mean... You mean when the you common, say, the common. So you, you need the Visa, the Mastercards, the American Expresses. If you, if you get those three, yeah, I think you take care of most of them. That's uh, a good starting point. Yeah, it is. Let's put it that it would cover at least 70, 80 percent. Mm -hmm. That's one. If you go to China, how many payment methods do they need over there? They probably need WeChat Pay, Alipay, which run on Union Pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are. The, the essentials to start serving the market. Notice that those are this is a market where it is a little bit over half a billion, and one is a billion. And let's go to GCC, which is 55 million. You need a minimum in the GCC seven payment methods, minimum, <laughs> because five out of the six pay, uh, five of, out of the six GCC countries have their local payment networks, which right. is five. Plus Visa, MasterCard, and Amex, which you mentioned for US. So it's very important to understand that. So if you are in Kuwait, if you are in Kuwait, Kenet is the prominent. Mm -hmm. If you're in Saudi, Meda is the prominent. Mm -hmm. If you are in Bahrain, it's Benefit. If you are in Oman, it's Omanet. And if you are in Qatar, it's Snaps. Even if you're in Egypt, it's Misa and you have the alternative payment methods of FAURI. So the region here is very much having different uh, preferences by consumers. That means the awareness of setting up acceptance to serve the market requires a bigger investment at the moment. No, I do agree. I do agree. I think there's complexity, but, but I'm also a big believer that, that I think public infrastructure or public financial infrastructure in the long term is of great benefit True. and great benefit to fintechs, right? Um, I had a very interesting con conversation on the couch with the chief fintech officer of, of Singapore, uh, Swapnandu Mohanty, and we actually had this discussion that, you know, there has been an age of fintechs which were created who basically were playing the arbitrage in the inefficiency that existed in public infrastructure and to solve that, right? And, and, and there was a view that while that is good and that's required and that meets the purpose, that might not be the most sustainable way, right? If you have public infrastructure and you're able to build fintechs on the back of that, you build a much more sustainable business. And you're seeing that in countries like well, China is one example, right? Uh, uh, but India is a very good example with UPI, sure. right? We're seeing something like that in Brazil, right? Uh, I think we're seeing something like that in Saudi Arabia eventually with, you know, with everything that Saudi payments is built, right? I think a lot of that will play a role with open banking. I, I'm, it I'm, opens up the whole I, I framework. Just, I just hope open banking and open finance here are able to realize some of the potential. Because I think in Europe, while it is now starting to take traction, it's taken quite a lot of time. True. And some of the use cases that have been quite widely accepted um, haven't got a lot of people as excited as they could. 
Uh, and, and there's another question there to say that should we go through this journey of open banking, open finance and open data, right? Uh, or should we just jump straight to open data, right? <laughs> Uh, because that's the three-dimensional view, sure. right? And I'm borrowing someone else's quote who I actually heard at uh, the London Week. So so I guess then that begs the question, right? Where do you think are the biggest gaps and the opportunities in the payment space as we talk about the GCC? You can choose one country or, or, or two, and we don't have to cover all, all, all the six countries. Where do you think are the biggest opportunities and gaps? Uh, gaps is that is very clear. I've been mentioning it <laughs> earlier. Uh, we're very highly fragmented. Uh, nothing is standardized. Every country runs. But that's not going to change, is it? I believe it will change with time. The okay. GCC Council is actually uh, so working. they will introduce some level of interoperability. You're saying true, and okay. and that's happening at the moment because it's available. But there used to be something called GCC Net. It's still there. Yeah, I know it is, but it doesn't get used as often. It is being used, but we don't notice it. Okay. Why? Because if you have your card that is in Saudi mm -hmm. running on Meda and you go use it in Kuwait, it actually runs on GCC Net. GCC Net. Okay. But that's not yet available online. Yeah. So fair. what's going to happen eventually, you're going to see that you can pay with your Knet in Saudi, Meda and UAE, Benefit in in uh, Qatar and Oman Net in Saudi, so you would see that, and it's all enabled through GCC Net. Uh, the thing is, I think it will take time. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of investment of sharing those networks between all of those countries that's taking place at the moment, and uh, it will change and it will evolve uh, in the coming years. Now, from our end, we realize that this is a problem and the market can't wait. For us, we saw this as an opportunity. Agreed. So how can we play a role into bringing a, a closer offering to someone who is based in Saudi who wants to serve their customers in the region or someone in the UAE and vice versa in every country in the GCC? Mm -hmm. And that's what we did while also have, having an open dialogue with the GCC, so we would contribute to the needs of what should be taking place as it gets up implemented for online payments. Okay, so let, let me ask, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask a question which is gonna force you to put a crystal ball in front of you, but before I do that, right, give me a little bit of uh, an understanding of what makes the, what is the constituent parts of the flows that TAP payments currently manage in terms of, you know, online versus offline? Uh, you know, what percentage of your offline is now, uh, you know, tap and go versus, uh, you know, uh, chip and pin? Sure. Um, uh, you know, is there uh, an MPOS component which is growing or not give us give us a rough picture without revealing too much sure sure right so first we're uh core to our dna is online yeah so the majority of our business is actually online okay we do uh card present pos in kuwait mm -hmm. uh, we we like to test things out in our homegrown market Fair enough. uh and basically uh going to online I would say uh, there is a big growth, huge growth of device payments. Okay. Uh, it started off because a lot of the payment networks here in the region, they either have uh, card payments or redirect payments. Mm -hmm. Even though those redirect payments are also card, but we treat them separately. And what do we do with as our offering in TAP, is we look at the technology that connects with those networks. We look at the payment experience that is provided to consumers uh, by connecting to those networks and how we can streamline the financial handling of money that comes from those networks all the way to the merchants. How can we look at all those experiences and simplify them into a unified flow, whether it is having a single API that 
connects all of them together. Having a single report that brings them all together. A single reconciliation when you get your funds in your bank account. We try to make it very simple, but of course there are many steps to make it uh, reach that level. Now, where do we see a lot of trends taking place? With online, and similarly is happening with point of sale, is device payments. Device payments, if it's online, it's running on pass-through wallets, such as Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, Benefit Pay in, in Bahrain, uh, and there are others coming out. When this, those same device payments are actually taking place and pass, those are all contactless payments. Mm-hmm. So that this is where, we're, where we see things are heading. What does this mean? It means that card payments are there, they are just layered with another layer on top to speed up the process of authentication and uh, having protected payments, basically. So, Ali, there's so many players in this space now, True. right? Um, there are homegrown players, there are regional players, there are international players, right? Um, e-commerce is growing, but obviously it's now not growing at the same rate as it was at during COVID. Right. right. Um, um, there is still the world of offline, and you're very correct in saying that a, a very significant percentage of that offline world is going into the wallet segment. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I don't remember the last time I tapped my my credit or debit card. I usually use my phone, and I, you know, I'm just a proxy. How isn't it turning into a bit of a red ocean? Um. It, it seems very uh, over, let's say, populated. But we've seen that there's so much noise, but very few actually solving problems. Okay. If you just put aside all of the, the quantity that's there and look at the quality, it's just a, a very limited number who are actually impacting the market. Okay, that's interesting. That's the way we see it. That might take time to evolve because it's happening in one country but not happening in another country. What we've noticed is that it might be a red ocean in one country in the GCC, but go just to the neighbor, it's just a blue ocean. Now, it might seem like a red ocean, but if you put them all together, it's still not yet solved. And, 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 And so... What's unique about your strategy? Are you targeting segments that typically people are not going after? Uh, is it the way your tech works? Is it because you have the friendliest salespeople? Uh, is it because uh, you know your pricing uh, or your commercial structures are interesting? Is it all of the above? Uh, so what's the spike here? What, what, so- what kind of makes tap payment... You know, what makes me as a merchant want to speak to you? Let's put it that way. So uh, it's, it, dip, it starts with how we started. Startups and SMEs is where we started. It's very close to our hearts. It's what drives us and how we build innovation because we want them to grow, basically. Uh, but we realized as we're offering and helping them grow, we started unlocking different problems for other segments in the market. So we've split our clients into various segments. Tech startups is one. SMEs is another. Local enterprises is a third. Fourth is a multinational regional player Mm -hmm. or global player. Fifth would be a fintech. We look at those five. The offering for each of those segments is completely different than one another. And it's very... uh, uncommon to have a company that offers to all of them we happen to have the ambition to ser- want to serve all of them. Uh, and we believe that we've been doing so in a way where it has been adding value now where is the majority of payment companies in the region focusing on they're primarily focusing on local enterprises mm-hmm. there is four additional segments that I mentioned, yep. which 
they're much very much underserved. So from where we look at things, the value added part is on seg on market segments that are not being served today by the traditional payment providers or slash banks, I would say. Mm -hmm. And that's where we differentiate ourselves. So let me ask you a straight straight off question, right? So there, there is a there is a there is a good reason why some of them do not target some of those market uh, some of those customers. One of them is the cost of customer acquisition. True, right? Uh, um, I, I I I should have introduced myself uh, earlier in sense not you know my margin, the, but the <laughs> fact is that I actually worked for a merchant for about six years where I used to run payments for them across sure. eight different markets, right? Sure. Uh, and I, I've had several such conversations with, with uh, you know, payment companies. How are you able to justify the the cost of acquiring those customers when a lot of the others are shying away? Do you do it through partnerships? Do you have something unique in the way you actually run your business development? Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm getting too no, deep it's, into the conversation, but it's fascinating it's, to, it's, uh, to hear. It's transparent for us. Uh, well, if we were a company that focused on enterprises from the beginning, we wouldn't have been very efficient in our processes and use of technology to automate such processes. Mm -hmm. Since the beginning, that was the challenge that we wanted to solve. We realized that we were lucky that we were focusing on that from the beginning. When you look at enabling payments for the masses, which are startups and SMEs, processes are very important. How do you onboard that client? How do you get them live to accept payments? How do you service them in a, in a manner where there are thousands and hundreds of thousands that are out there? So, and when you're a startup, you're a small team. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna build an army? No, because it's just going to burn liquidity. How can you do it very efficiently? So we faced this challenge in the early days, okay. which we didn't realize at the time. It allowed us to scale much faster than many others. A company like us that started with enterprise wouldn't be able to have that same flexibility because the cost of acquisition would be much higher. Now, what we've developed with time is that also it doesn't mean that what we've built is the right structure for enterprises because it's a completely different game. We realize that our offering unlocked problems for enterprises, but the building of the process of relationship, of onboarding and the, the, the legacies of enterprises and how do you build that? It's completely different. Agreed. So what we've done in the company is we split our teams, our business teams, into two separate divisions. Okay. Enterprise divisions, a division which handles local enterprises and global enterprises, and the rest of the tech startups and SMEs. And you handle large companies with account managers while you handle startups and SMEs with teams. It's like if you're in a bank, you have private banking and you have corporate banking. Mm -hmm. That's the way we look at it. Okay, no, that that makes perfect sense. So, so you have not necessarily tied up with any uh, distribution partnerships. You still focus on actually targeting and onboarding these customers yourself. Today, today, more like the effort of onboarding is on us, but we strongly believe in partnership. Okay, uh, partnership doesn't mean always generating leads. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. It also plays a role, but it's not always the case. But who are the main partners that we look at? Payment networks, yep. our key partners, payment acquirers, payment issuers, uh, e-commerce platforms. Those are key players. Mm -hmm. And banks, of course, because when I mention payment acquirer does, or issuer, doesn't mean it's a bank always. All of those five, uh, let's say, stakeholders play a very important role uh, in serving those uh, clients, merchants, because that's what I mean by process for st startups and SMEs. We need to look at all of those five because uh, they can't, how can you streamline masses if you're not organizing the process between all of those five segments? Fair enough. 
Fair enough. And I, I think it makes perfect sense. And I think the, the stronger you have the relationship with these five people or five types of uh, partners, I think it, it catalyzes change across the, the entire value chain. Right. So I'm going to switch gear a little bit. I'm going to take you into uh, the world of the future. I forgot to bring the crystal ball. Uh, but so imagine there's one lying in front of you. What do you really see as some of the trends, and I'm not going to put a number, but you know, three to five trends, which you think are going to shape the way payments plays out uh, in our part of the world. And you can choose this to be domestic payments, cross-border, fast, whatever it is, right? So very keen to hear a payment practitioner's perspective in terms of what are the five things or three things which are radically going to impact and change sure. payments in our part of the world where you and I live? I would uh, uh, start off with um, one that is very, let's say, proactive or progressive in some markets in GC and the the opposite where being conservative in the rest of the GCC, which is crypto. Crypto is is uh, is is one of the key, let's say, behaviors or payment methods, uh, because today it's a currency and a payment method. I think that will evolve. It's good to see how that moves, and there's a lot of traction for the future there. That's so one. you really think people actually want to come and use their Bitcoin to buy cups of coffee? Maybe not a Bitcoin, but some form of crypto. Okay. And uh, because Bitcoin is not yet efficient for payments. Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, from a time processing perspective. But we do see, we already see demand from merchants that are looking to enable crypto. We do see that. We haven't done it yet, but uh, we have seen some traction there. Okay. Uh, we understand also there is there are hypes. And now I think... The hype has been much less than before, but it's still there. So that that is one. Two, I would say, which is still the hype, BMPL. Okay. BMPL has basically a lot of traction. Uh, I would say just because of the role of paying with credit. Uh, I would be a little uh, conservative to evaluate how it will continue uh, in a in a in a in a positive manner because it needs to be within credit lines today it's not so i think the 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 companies that have played a role here they have played a lot with the experience so that mm -hmm. is very important so bmpl is another part uh another a third one would be not a not a, a core thing but it plays a role into the whole experience, and we see it happening today, which are biometric payments. Okay. Biometric today, we don't realize it, but facial recognition payments. Today we do it with Apple Pay. And we're doing it without us realizing that it is driving payments with biometric authentication. So I think that's what's moving, and there will be always a layer underneath whether it is going to be uh, let's say a fiat currency with a traditional card payment or a crypto or a BNPL laying with that biometric experience. So that will be interesting to see how they work with each other. Finally, I would say a fourth one that is I'm waiting to see how it evolves is open banking. Yep. Open banking is uh, another important layer uh, which is still under, let's say, development in many different countries here in the region. And it will play a role as another rail that runs with all of what I just mentioned earlier. Basically. So let me ask you a question, right? So so I'm sure you're familiar with UPI in India. Yes. You're familiar with PIX in, in Brazil. You don't see a role for faster payments in this part of the world? It is happening. Like, I would say... Today, uh, real-time transfers, let's say, mm -hmm. needs to be first widely adopted before it gets used as payments. 
real tri- real time transfers has been already rolled out in Saudi. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is soon going to be available in other GCC countries. Mm-hmm. The GCC council countries are already rolling out real time transfers between, between each themselves. other. Uh, yep. So today we see a lot of investment on the transfer side of things. Now, if once you have that set up with open banking, you might see real time payments or faster payments. Mm-hmm. You do see it in, a, in different ways. Um, we've seen it in Kuwait in a very interesting way. Today, there is a huge trend where transferring funds in Kuwait is actually different uh, than the re- neighboring countries. It's always a money request. Today, if I would like to send you money, let's say 100 dirhams, or a thousand, I would just ask you, send me a link. I would get a link from your bank. I would pay with my debit card and you instantly get it. And that's a common practice of uh, payments or peer-to-peer in Kuwait today, which is not yet fully adopted in the rest of the region. You see it in Bahrain in a different way with benefit pay. I would say benefit pay is more of a similar experience as a WeChat pay with a face of an Apple pay, let's say. So, 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 so I can't disagree with any of the five or four or six trends that we've spoken about, right? Um, some of them are real. Some of them are already here and actually we're experiencing it. So, and, so what's tap payments attitude towards these things? Are you, you're obviously observing them very closely. Right, is the intent to build your own tech or you will look to partner and facilitate uh, uh, someone else's product through your uh, ecosystem? So let's go to where we, what is the purpose of what we're doing in TAP? We're looking to enable and simplify payment acceptance. Yep. In whatever form. So if there is a new trend of behavior that is being adopted by the market, it's our role to bring it on board, put it along with our standards, keep it simple to enable for our clients. So all of those different behaviors are are on our radar. Okay. We, today, the being specialized in enablement it's completely different than offering it ourselves. We prefer to be specialized in enabling all of those payment methods okay. in whatever form they are. But are you making a bet, and I don't mean the bet in sense of betting, but are you taking a bet on any of these four or five where you are proactively saying, I'm going to start working on this now because I do think that this will come. It has disruptive capabilities. It has the ability to potentially even hurt what we do today. You can even just tell me yes or no, but are you taking a bet on some of these where you're saying, Arjun, I'm already building capabilities, right? Uh, Although it's not yet proven that this will be a super success. I'll give you an example of one that we've seen, we see a lot of traction going, but we decided to do it as a partner. So... In Kuwait, BMPL is yet to be regulated and rolled out. And we found a company that wants to do it. They haven't started yet. And they got, we worked with them with the regulator, where today offering it to the market is collaboratively, our role is to enable, and their role is to perform the BMPL. So... Why are we doing that? It goes back to our, uh, let's say, mission. If we go and focus on one of those, it will distract us from enabling all of them. And if you want to enable one of them today, you would always need to work with a partner that enables you, or you need to build it yourself. I don't want to be like, say um, I don't want to be hard on companies that are trying to do that they can but doing both is not the same as focusing on one 
Agree. So we prefer to enable partners. That's the focus of what we're trying to do. Yeah. So you want to build an open ecosystem. People can come, plug into you, and through plugging into you, you actually can plug it for your merchants. Your merchants can choose whether or not there's a particular service that they want or not. And I think that makes perfect sense because there's no better way to scale. You know, a, 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 a smart person once said, you know, just to drink milk, you don't need to own the cow. Right? True. Uh, and, True. And I think, you know, there is a lot of sense uh, in that. Uh, sometimes you might have to own the cow when you're being highly progressive. Yeah. But I guess... You know, we're not in that stage today. Yeah, you're not in that stage. We don't. Today. We don't. We we see there is still a lot of development in the market, and it's still very early. Let me talk about a couple of other technologies. So we're going. We're going. You know, we're going to just shift slightly to technology, right? So, so um, you know, there is so much conversation around blockchain, uh, and now every bit of conversation is around AI, yeah. right? What role? do either or both of those technologies uh, play? And I think it's a two-part question again in the evolution of the whole, you know, payments sector yeah. or payments acceptance. And, and you know, what is TAP Payments doing about it, right? Do you really see these as heavily disruptive technologies for what you do? And if so, how are you responding to them? They are. Um, uh, we haven't... Blockchain has been, uh, let's say, a vertical that a lot has been going around it, but mm -hmm. not a lot has been rolled out mm -hmm. yet. We see a lot that can be beneficial uh, when you move towards electronic assets. Uh, digital assets plays a huge role with blockchain. So having being in digital payments, aligning it with digital assets, blockchain is a very important piece to streamline the, the ownership of those assets uh, and give a track on the payment side. Mm -hmm. So that's where we see blockchain. Uh, of course, there's many other use cases, but this is what I can think of yeah. right now. If we go to AI, I think it's moving a bit faster. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thousand tools a week these days. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch up, to be honest. Well, I, nobody can catch up. I, I've given up catching up. But what I do do is I spend every weekend, and I've actually done this for the last eight to ten weekends, if not longer. I actually take one tool every weekend, cool. and I try and play around with it. I miserably fail at being able to harness the power of some of these tools. But I think I'm getting better and better. So actually my mid-journey pictures are getting quite good, <laughs> right? That's for change. Uh, um, I'm getting better at using ChatGPT, although it terrifies me what it does. Uh, and I have a 12-year-old who seems to have now heard about it, which worries me because, you know, I would want her to be writing her essays, <laughs> not chat GPT writing her essays. <laughs> but I guess that's what the future holds. But sorry, this is not about what me and my 12-year-old are doing, but but on AI, right? So what's what's your take on AI payments? Because there's there are tremendous use cases, right? Uh, uh, me being a payments person myself, I, I can see. How do you see it in its... <laughs> Initial avatars, how do you think it's going to kind of come into the ecosystem? I think it's already happening initially yeah. with payments, primarily in risk, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Risk and behavioral attribute uh, of transaction. Uh, what is happening there is how we can perform transactions in a protective manner. That's where AI is going to speed up a lot, and it's already starting at the moment. I believe one of the payment gateways provided by one of the payment networks are, are decommissioning one risk of a risk uh, uh, software into another just for the purpose of having some AI behind it. So uh, what we believe that's an entry point, but uh, where it's going to reach, I think it's a question like uh, where is the internet going to go in the in the 90s <laughs> when that question was given back then i think ai is truly uh, uh, an innovation that will speed up things in a manner that is really hard to predict at the moment i'm not sure 
I simply as as I know. No, I, and and that's it. So I have concerns regarding you know the ethical side of AI. I also think a lot of people have challenged that it's innovation versus compliance. But some of this innovation actually makes compliance better, right? If it's actually applied properly, sure. I think where the complexity comes, at least from from a from a from my perspective, is that we are seeing so many technologies at the same time, right? go through the curve so much faster and a lot of these technologies interact with each other incredibly well right so so if we are not ahead of the curve in terms of you know testing and learning and using these yeah. the fear is that you're going to be left behind but at the same time you got to be able to see you know you know separate the trees from the woods as they say right because uh, you can easily get preoccupied right and go through this process of sort of you know uh, intellectual exercise without yeah. actually seeing any real benefit derived from it so i think you know businesses will need to get smarter True. i do think that there is an element that the way our businesses will look in terms of personnel will, will change will change yeah. and it'll change faster than than we can and then that brings another question saying do we have access to that sort of talent true right and if we don't have that access to that talent means well we better start upskilling and reskilling the people that we have yeah uh, and i don't think we can just sit back and say that you know there's a magic button out there we will press well maybe there is a magic button but i haven't <laughs> seen one that that'll that'll solve that so um i i i find this both fascinating but at the same time worrying there there is one thing i would like to please put a comment there on how i would compare ai or where it's going or how it's been going to be used versus something that we're using today uh, navigation that you're using today with driving or going from one place to another we used to use maps yeah. now we rely on software that tells us where to go yeah. i think what's going to happen and what's tricky with ai is it's going to be the same thing today there are people that can use such software for navigation but they can move without it it's fine but there is a huge population that can't yep that's what scares me I, with ai i totally agree i think i think the 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 separation between the have and have nots arguably becomes even greater yeah so so you know yet to be proven whether ai is an inclusive tool and whether it will be used for inclusion yeah. or not i had somebody about 3 years ago at an event in dubai turn around and said that the future is between kids who will know how to code and kids who won't and trust me i kind of walked out of that 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 discussion so concerned going if this guy is right right we're going to create a very different version of the haves and have nots sure. right um no i think there there, there are tremendous uh, uh social uh, uh uh dynamics uh and and social changes uh which these new technologies will bring back we come back to tap payments and i'm conscious of time right so where are we going next ali with tap payments so um our journey is global All so right. we are solving a piece right now in the region we have unlocked a piece that we've so seen demand globally who are looking to serve their client their payers in the region and we started doing so in the east and the west and we're looking to help companies that are in the region grow globally okay uh, in a manner where since such offering is available then they can expand globally starting from the middle east and when you say global do you mean global or do you mean that there is actually a very large population a large number of countries which are sort of just north of where we are towards the east because i'm assuming you don't want to take on no, china and india right of course not yes. no no that from that perspective what i would have to highlight there being in the industry we're in payments it's a very uh, let's say specialized vertical in different regions you don't come to a payments company that's running in brazil and do better job than how they're doing it in brazil 
So collaboration is very important. You can do a small piece, but what bridges all of those networks together, there are very limited number of companies today that do, do that globally. And they do, they do it in a very uh, positive way and the value added is very strong. What we've seen, where is our value added, is how to build the connection between the region to the world and the world to the region, which is yet not offered in a very clean way. That's our approach of global. So what we mean by that is our presence in metropolitan global cities that are looking to accept payments in the region and vice versa, companies in the region who are looking to go to those global cities. Mm -hmm. That's our perspective of global. Okay, so this is gonna be my last question, right? But I'm gonna actually put a very challenging question on this, right? So I fundamentally believe in the whole concept of unified commerce, right? Uh, and unified commerce for me is sort of the next step beyond omni-channel, which means it's not just the front-end interaction, but also the back-end interaction, right? Now, uh, you don't have to agree with that concept. You can say no. No, I do agree. No. Right. now. If you want to have unified commerce, and, and especially if you want to work with, as you said, companies, go with them internationally, help international companies here and so on and so forth, you've got to have the offline play. True. Right? True. Because, because at least, uh, you know, you're a young guy, uh, but even in sort of my career, which might last another 10, 15 years, whatever it is, I don't think offline is going anywhere. Like it's, I always think, it's cash always gonna, also It's good. always going to remain. Yeah, it's always going to remain because people still like to go shop. Yes, the experience in store will change. I think, you know, card not present transactions will grow in, in store. You can arguably call them as e-commerce transactions, so on and so forth. What's your view as tap payments in terms of saying, you know, fine, we've aced the whole online piece. We're as good as anybody else. We're building lots of good value-added services, and I'm sorry I'm talking on behalf of you, Thank you. right? But I'm assuming <laughs> you, you will say that. What's your take on the whole offline piece? So since we've been doing it for a few years now in Kuwait, we've exposed ourselves to offline. And it's, we've done it just so we are closer to, the, uh, to offering such uh, a service. How is it different than online? Uh, and how we can bring it all together. Uh, so going into offline payments, it's happening. Mm -hmm. We just believe uh, there are two types of offline payments. There is the offline payment as we know it today. And there is the offline payment, which is more digital, omni-channel uh, offline payments. Mm -hmm. Today, both are important. It agreed. Yeah. They're very important, both yeah. of them. Now, when we come and talk about the offering for traditional brick and mortar, traditional is very important. Today, this is uh, not a core part of what we focus on globally. Uh, the ones we focus on globally are online, mm -hmm. primarily. Uh, so if they're looking for brick and mortar setups with traditional passes, uh, we do it with partners. Okay. When it comes down to omni-channel digital payments on the go. This is something we're giving a really close attention to. We haven't done it yet. Uh, we are still doing R&D on such. And we're planning to see how we can enter that vertical in a manner that would add value that is different than what is happening today. Uh, keeping aside that when we deal with specific let's say, regional or multinational companies, we do care about how to solve that brick and mortar piece, but through partnerships. Okay, so I did say it was my last question, but I'll make that my second last question. This is definitely my last <laughs> question, and then, and then I, will, I will let you go because I've, I've kept you here for too long. Uh, in the online world, right, uh, there's always been a trend, uh, what the, there has been a trend for the last five to six years, if not longer, 
uh, where a number of value-added services have been bolted on, right? Uh, and, and those value-added services initially were sort of mocked and joked about, right? But increasingly are actually becoming the form of differentiator, right? And especially now that you introduce things like AI, uh, which has a massive impact on the, on the fact that you can do stuff with data. I have a very corny sentence which goes with this, which goes like this. If data is the new oil, payments data is the olive oil. Right. I like it. Uh, right. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not quite sure everybody liked it, but no, I, I like it. I, right? I, I get it. Uh, so, so what value added layers have you guys been building? What's, you know, what's coming on? What's actually cool out there? I, I'm actually quite keen to actually understand where is this value added stuff going? I think uh, a lot of payment companies uh, talk about the data that it has, but not a lot of payment companies have yet figured out how to use this data. Yep, agreed. Uh, and most don't know how to monetize it. Yes. Uh, I believe most payment companies haven't yet figured it out till today. Uh, what we have been looking into data is that uh, we've realized that it's not only on the actual transaction, it's what happens before, at the transaction, and after the transaction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start out with before the transaction. Today, since we're looking at mass enablement for clients, there's a lot of data there. Uh, and what we have realized is that that could be an offering by itself for fintechs. Mm -hmm. And that's a vertical that is not typically offered by payment companies. And we've given it attention and we've built software we haven't rolled it out yet to the market, but that's a vertical that we have given attention to. And we have built it in a way where we've solutioned it as a product and we're looking to pilot it in the near future uh, in some markets before we roll it out across all markets. And that plays a role a lot with data that is connected with government services, uh, trusted services, and plays a role into levels of risk, levels of security, and impacts also transactions, since a lot of this data has a lot of interesting value-added, let's say, fingerprints on top of what's happening in the transaction. So I believe we're in the early stage of how to utilize data. I've just mentioned one of the pieces where we're giving attention to. There is a lot more, but uh, we're taking it one step at a time. Great. Ali, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. To the studio. I would say all the way from Kuwait, but God knows where you flew in from because you... you I actually you, you, came you, from Riyadh. You came from Riyadh. Okay, well, well, well thank you for coming from Riyadh. Uh, I'm going to be there next week. I'm heading to Kuwait tomorrow. Oh, you're heading to Kuwait, <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, well, I thought I was the management consultant, but it seems like you have a worse, uh, a worse travel schedule than I do. But no, I really appreciate you coming in and, and you know, giving us a candid view. Uh, you know, it's been interesting to understand, uh, you know, the business that you've created. I'll be honest with you. I had no clue you guys had been around for as long as you have been. Right. Uh, but it's good to see that, you know, you got your business is flourishing. You're in pretty much every market uh, that we, you know, that that constitutes the GCC and beyond. Yes. Right. Um, so, you know, best of luck. Um, um, hope your, you know, your vision and mission sort of comes to fruition. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll, 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 as they say, you know, we'll chew the fat on payments uh, because I need to also get a few refreshers uh, uh, on the whole world of payments. But with that, thank you. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Ali Abul Hassan, who is the CEO and founder of Tap Payments. Uh, and that was the Tap Payments journey. Uh, I think we, we, we heard a lot about where the business has come from, where the business is heading, uh, you know, he shared his views on what he believes will be disruptive. Uh, we even got to 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 talk about crypto uh, and the fact that people are going to be buying their coffee using crypto, uh, which is another day, another conversation. But with that, I'll say goodbye and till next week. Bye bye.